Pedro is going to uh, uh, look at the challenges facing um, the oil and gas industry and the digital challenges facing the oil and gas industry and the Open Group initiative that is uh, seeking to uh, help all those organizations address that. So, um, Pedro, great to see you, and uh, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Pedro Vieira. I work for Petrobras, and we'll use the next minutes to talk about some key challenges of the oil and gas industry. It's way to digital, and finally, how these two things are deeply connected. Okay. There's a, a view expressed the disclaimer before we start. I'd like you to please pay attention to. Okay, uh, this is our agenda. I'm going to start with the objective of this presentation, discuss the current scenario of oil and gas industry, its challenges and digital needs, the path to digital, and finally, its participation in the open group. We want to present more than a scenario. We want to present a perspective, a perspective that uh, beyond the crisis and the virus, focus on opportunity. Opportunity to build an efficient ecosystem around the oil and gas industry to find the gold, the black gold, data. Data that allows not only a safer and more efficient operation, but also gives energy to the necessary transformations in the world. Energy to transform, to give energy to a transformed world. And that's you. I want you to consider you may have a role in this, even and especially if you don't work for the oil and gas sector. Let's take a look at the oil and gas scenario. Last week we saw the craziest period for oil prices in history, especially in the US. The global market of oil is suffering very much with a severe decrease in demand due to COVID-19 lockdowns and considerable increase in crude oil inventories. Another component in this equation was the oil price war triggered in last March by Saudi Arabia responding to Russia's refusal to reduce its oil production to hold prices of crude oil. As we can see, in just two months, the brand crude oil price dropped from 50, 60 to 20, 30 dollars. The question everyone wants to be answered is, when is the oil barrel price going to return to normal? We don't know when, but we certainly know when not. Most recent studies and projections show that the oil price won't be back to $50, $60 plateau for at least one year from now. Here we can see an updated study about the global oil demand recovery, considering an effective prevention and control scenario for COVID-19. The red curve shows the valley in April when we'll have approximately a 30 million barrels per day decrease in the global oil demand, reaching 20 million decrease in June and 10 million decrease just by the end of this year. Just to note, in the beginning of this month, OPEC and other oil producing countries cut the production in nearly 10 million barrels a day and that's almost 25% of OPEC total production. That's why the inventories remain high and prices low. But what does it mean when 
we say the price is high or low. Compared to what? This is called the break-even price. Simply, it is the value of an equivalent barrel of crude oil in which companies have no profit or loss. This value depends on the number of factors and is quite variable around the world. The x-axis shows the production capacity in millions of barrels per day. The y-axis is the break-even price range. Rectangles are different regions or forms of production around the world. The first thing we can see is that Saudi Arabia's uh, break-even price in mean is something around $10, while U.S. tight oil is around 50 but uh, can be as cheap as Saudi Arabia's in some fields, the lower part of the rectangle. From this kind of graph, you can see the impact of oil price in the viability of oil and gas business in many places. In general, the physical assets of oil and gas industry are very analog. There is uh, have a low digitalization. Why? Well, we have a long life cycle for our production facilities. It can reach 10 years before producing and 34 years producing oil, which means that we have today operating units that were designed 30, 40, even 50 years ago. As you can imagine, especially for those in IT industry, even with revamps and updates. It is very likely that we have legacy and proprietary technologies in these other plants, which, however, need to work safely and reliably. Although newer, newer greenfield projects uh, already incorporate digital solutions in times of uncertainty, it may be needed to consider expanding the lifetime of brownfield plants, postponing investments until it's possible to have a clearer view of the new business risks. Digital rely on information available. When we talk about industrial plants, it's synonym of instrumentation data available through the automation system. Older plants often don't offer all the needed data, making it difficult to fully go digital. And finally, as it is a very complex industry, it is natural that the knowledge silos that quickly become data silos that limit information exchange internally and externally to the company. Here's a study of several sectors in the digital maturity in several areas considered. We will focus on numbers two and four, which represent respectively the potential to further digitize the physical assets and the potential to improve the digitization of business-to-business -business relationships, which are quite intense in the oil and gas industry. As we can see, the oil and gas sector is mapped with a very low relative digitalization in these two areas, having, however, good maturity in others, such as spending on digital training for their employees. Now that we have a general idea of the oil and gas scenario, we can discuss some challenges, especially for the upstream offshore top sites. I've divided the key challenges for the oil and gas industry into five categories. Safety and security, cost, productivity, integration, and business. 
safety is the absolute priority of oil and gas. The main challenge is how to use digital to improve health, safety, and environment performance from design to operations. Since we will expect more connected plants, cybersecurity turns into an important issue because uh, at the end of the day, it is strictly linked to safety. Everybody remembers this Tuxnet cyber attack 10 years ago in Iran, no? To reduce costs, there are several initiatives. Three of them are listed here. Inclu increase exploration success rate. Today it's around 40% in the world. 90% in Brazilian pre -salt. Reduce uh, total project time from exploration to startup, thus uh, decreasing the payback period for the investment, and decrease supply and logistics costs. The next pillar is uh, productivity, where we have the challenges of increasing and sustaining the operational efficiency and decreasing the unit's downtime. The other focus must also be on the engineering, not just a fast, configurable design, but a top quality, technical product to minimize the cost of rework in the project that can reach 5% of total cost of unit. There are also integration opportunities space to improve internal and external B2B sectors integration in terms of effective information exchange and reduce vendor technology dependency, that is, proprietary systems and solutions. Finally, we have the business spine. Improve on-time decision-making capabilities based on reliable information Guarantee a continuous training in digital techniques and procedures for new and existing employees. And improve effectiveness and agility, the business repositioning with a robust change management framework, considering processes, technology, and people. At last, create and sustain a culture of bimodal model. Modeling the business to seek the balance between operations and innovation. We saw the scenario, the challenges or opportunities for the oil and gas industry. And now let, let's take a quick look at the roadmap of possible digital solutions to address these issues. The first thing covering the first two pillars, as always, is safer and better operations. Automatic diagnostics, hybrid twin, that is physically based but data-driven, with online closed-loop simulation, opening path to condition-based and proactive maintenance, and so, zero and planned downtime and remote operations. Then, focusing on open and transparent information flow in secure vendor neutral systems and data format, data centric designs, processes and systems, and high value indexed data with associated metadata and microservices for interoperability and reusability. These open data solutions work as a very efficient digital enablers. And then a digital ready enterprise where we can talk about automated configurable project and engineering design development a digital framework to guide training and practices to be able to create and sustain an agile digital innovation ecosystem with business to business and customer relations. And finally, a digital ready enterprise architecture framework 
to support the new business dynamics during the digital age. The oil and gas companies uh, founded and conduct two forums in the Open Group. The OPA, there is the Open Process Automation Forum, and the OSTU, Open Subsurface Data Universe. The question is, why? What are they looking for? As you can see, I put in TOG in TOG, that is the oil and gas in the open group. I hope you liked it. The OPA is making possible not just the standardization of the automation architecture for the process plants, but it's also a huge enabler for digital in this plants, for all the phases from conceptual design to decommissioning. A similar work is being done to subsurface data, exploration, wells, reservoir, by OSU. Not just creating a common open data format and exchange, but supporting an open application layer that will make possible for anyone to develop creative solutions using the data generating value for the industry. Once all this data is available, we can apply digital techniques, for example, AI, big data, analytics, to cross-analyze it and return the results to the operations. For example, optimizing the operations, suggesting procedures, automating solutions, predicting shutdowns, helping to plan maintenance, consolidating information for business decision-making, etc. Obviously, to realize these digital solutions, one has to have a trained and certified workforce in digital principles and techniques internally to companies. That's where another product from the Open Group enters, the DPBOC, Digital Practitioner's Body of Knowledge. We seek so many things at the same time. Optimization, open market, interoperability, open data, connectivity, value, information for decision, standardization, digital technologies, innovative solutions, open development, predictability, on-time solutions, efficiency, collaboration. We want to find the oil hidden in the data because data is the new path to energy. Any of you ready to join us? I'd like to thank the colleagues from Petrobras that helped me revise this presentation. Anderson Rocha, Fabio Hessler, and Italo Afonso. I leave you with my contact information. All the info is also encoded in the QR code on the right. Just point and shoot the, the QR, please. Thank you and have a nice event and stay safe. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, the oil and gas in the open group, hey? Eh? TOG for the open group. Thank you. Um, a very insightful presentation and uh, it's great to set the context first as you did um, and then the specific challenges for the industry and then um, and then what we're doing about it so uh, uh, we've got some questions coming in so I'm not going to uh, and some thanks coming in on the question uh, Q&A channel as well so uh, I think people are uh, in, enjoying what you were what you said um, so the first question for you Pedro um, how has the oil and gas industry accommodated government regulations to reduce petrol and diesel vehicles and the move to electric? What part will digital play to reduce domestic demand? I have two parts there. Okay. 
Uh, I think we'll see in the next 30 or 40 years a shift in the energy matrix. Uh, that shift is not because the oil will, will, is going to end. There's, uh, there's oil for 200 years. But uh, that uh, as the, <laughs> the, other, the other sources of energy did not end, but we have shifted from them. Right. But the, the, the thing is, the oil and gas industry is a capital, expan a, a capital intensive industry. So probably this industry is going to make the shift. The question is how? How is the oil and gas industry helping making the shift to a green energy, a green energy matrix or renewable energies? Not only by the force of regulations, as you, as you said, but uh, also for an, a social pressure around the world. I think this is the, the, the most significant point. So the industry is already accommodating the regulations uh, for this shift, but uh, I, I can see that the, the, the industry is preparing the shift for 20 years from now, 15, 20 years, because the, the metric is not going to change. We have a lot of energy uh, in hydrocarbons there is, that cannot be instantly replaced by other kinds of energy. Uh, so the economy cannot go by, cannot do that ship without the help of oil and gas industry, and it can be done instantly. And the second part of your question is how, what is the role that digital plays in this shift? I think it, it's, And re uh, reduce domestic demand specifically as well, Pedro, yeah. Uh, yes, the reduced domestic demands uh, is, is going to end. Uh, it, this is not a, it's a, it's a temporary uh, reduce. It's, we, are, we are seeing that uh, the demands, domestic and international, is going to return to normal in one year or something like that. That's the the it's a, it's a, in a long view. We can't uh, rely on the reduction of demand. So digital is the it's the it's the key for the shift because we have first we have to operate our units more safely and uh, with less people on board. And this is going to make the, the, the needed cash and investment for our ship to another matrix. So digital is the key or the roadmap or the way for the energy shift. I, I, I really don't see the reduce in demand as a long-term issue. Right. And of course, standards are key as well, as you were talking about. So, uh, next question, somebody uh, speaking from the heart by the uh, by the look of it. Um, my experience of oil and gas was that IT were second-class citizens in comparison to geologists and petrochemical engineers. How does digital work within this bias towards traditional engineers? <laughs> Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the same thing all around the world. Uh, I, I wouldn't say a, a, a kind of second class citizens, but yes, uh, geologists, uh, chemical engineers, they are kings in the oil and gas industry. But it's, it's going to change because uh, we, as, as we see, the oil and gas industry, you know, they can do more with the same. So we, we have to increase, for example, the exploration success from 40% to, for example, uh, 50 or 60%. Uh, for example, one day, if you rent a rig for one day, it's $400,000 a day. So uh, if you can increase that success rate, by using AI, for example, helping yeah. the geologists to analyze the data, 
or making decisions or pre-making decisions for revision for the geology to so geophysics, uh, the IT is going to enter the core business of oil and gas industry. And I think they will be, especially the data scientists, will be promoted to first-class citizens in the oil and gas. <laughs> Great to hear. Great to hear. And we have a data science workshop tomorrow as part of this event, which I'll, I'll give a give a, a plug to later on. But um, next question, um, OSDU, you talked about the Open Subsurface Data Universe Forum in the Open Group. So OSDU has the potential to disrupt suppliers of analytic services to the oil and gas industry. Do you see current suppliers shifting to adopt OSDU or new entrants coming in first or maybe both? Uh, the OSDU, uh, I was in Houston in 2018 uh, in the kickoff meeting of OSDU, led by Shell. Yeah. Uh, the the OSDU went uh, for the first for for the same path of OPA two or three years before. Yeah. Uh, it, it started with the owners. There is the, the majors, uh, ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, uh, Petrobras was not in the OPA, but was in the OSDU. Uh, and this is, the very, is, is, is a very important point because the owners have the money. The owners have the needs. Yeah. So the owners say, oh, we need an open data standard. We need an open application layer standard. We need an, an open standard for the automation architecture in our process plans. We do need it. We don't want to pay obsolescence. We don't want to pay uh, uh, a, sub, sub, a specific supplier with uh, proprietary technology anymore. Right. We don't want. We, we can't do that more because if we want to go digital, we have to have open data to make the data processing uh, possible mm -hmm. for an open application layer or an open store like Google Play or Apple Store or something like that. You can develop an application for the oil and gas industry. It uh, relies on open information flow. So because of, of, uh, of the formation of these two groups, the OPA and the OSDU mm -hmm. uh, being the owners conducting, I think that the both things are go is going to happen. Uh, both things are going to happen. Uh, current suppliers um, will be, there will be no choice for them. Uh, the owners are going to buy in some years uh, just from the suppliers that uh, is, uh, is, are capable of of supplying that open data or open application format. So okay. they, they, they don't, don't have a choice to do that or no. not. But I can see that the suppliers uh, are, are participating very well in this forum. So uh, yes, the, the suppliers are shifting to adopt OSU and OPA, and also new entrants are coming in, for, in first. Uh, I can, I can uh, say here, that uh, Intel, uh, that is uh, a long-term supplier for IT industry, processors, etc., is, be is beginning to, to open a sector dedicated to OPA, to process automation. That's a very new thing that I've, I've never seen before. It's a new entrant, but it's, it's an old industry. So, uh, yes, both things are, are happening because of the conduction of this forums uh, being done by the owners. Right. And, and, and you're right, it's and mentioning Intel. It's no, no coincidence that they've uh, just uh, stepped up their um, participation in the open group to platinum member status, our, our highest level as well. Um, and they are getting uh, more active, so it's, uh, that's great to see. And, um, and way, um, I, I'll, I'll give a plug for the Open Group Live site again. Um, on there, you will see a few videos. Um, uh, I'm afraid they've got me in them, so there'll be no no awards for uh, best actor or anything like that. But the the content and the story 
in those videos is what Pedro has been talking about and actually goes back to our early work um, in the Open Group Face Consortium with uh, Federal Avionics and then Open Process Automation. There's a, there's a chain that, that fundamentally starts with um, a customer need and a, and a desire to change the way that an industry um, procures its systems and, and operates um, for the next generation and uh, and the ones that, that Pedro you mentioned uh, are the latest in that line um, but you can trace it right back it, it it works when the customers have a have a demand and get together then uh, suppliers listen and uh, and participate actively so Pedro we're out of time there are a few questions um, coming in that uh, I've seen a couple around um, cloud um, if you get the opportunity, Pedro, and we're able to go in and answer some of those, that would uh, be appreciated. Um, but in the meantime, um, great to, to virtually see you. I look forward to seeing you in person uh, when we're able to. And uh, a virtual round of applause um, for Pedro Vieira. Thank you, Pedro.